grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience kindness, and to kindness brotherly, uh, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus our Lord. And he wants us to experience that today. About four to five meters behind me on the outside of this building, there is a sign. Part of that sign is important. Well, it's, it's all important. I'm not minimizing that. But part of that sign identifies this place. Uh, I don't even know if you know what it says, but I, I looked at it on the way in here. I think it says uh, something about Wesleyan Methodist Church. And that identifies a little bit of the framework of which this, this place operates. Now that to me is, uh, is, is, is an important aspect of the sign, but there is something that the sign says further than that, and I wonder if you know what it says just under that little identification. What does it say? A place where lives are changed. Now I was, I was blessed by uh, Jeff's prayer for us today but not quite as much as I was by a little girl this morning that prayed for you. Just before I came, I had a time with my little daughter, Karis. I said, Karis, I would love if you would just uh, pray for me this morning. In, um, in a few words, in a childlike prayer, she prayed that, I would, that her daddy would be able to preach the word. But then she prayed for you. She prayed for you. Here's what she prayed. God, help those who listen to learn what it means to become like Jesus. That's my prayer. For if these things are in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus our Lord. May that burn in our hearts today. May that, may that permeate this service. May that, may that resonate with each one of you as you are um, listening, as you are listeners today. Preachers have very unique ways of choosing sermon titles. This is one of them. Um, I've, I've used many methods in the past. Maybe something will capture my mind throughout the week. And I, I think that would be a good sermon title for what I've been contemplating as to what the Lord would have me to share. Um, probably this title that is on the screen, uh, the, the method will, will never be used again. Uh, that's, that's my prediction. Let me tell you a little bit how I came to this message title. I knew what I was going to preach about. I knew the framework of which the sermon outline was going to happen, but I hadn't put a, a title to it that I was comfortable with. As I was, uh, as I was going through a PowerPoint theme um, to, to make the PowerPoint for today, I, I came across a PowerPoint theme that had this as its title. Getting to know your teacher. Now, uh, this PowerPoint theme was designed for teachers to the first day of school, and I know that many of you are involved in education, um, so you probably know a little bit of what I'm referring to. But it's this idea that when you go to school for the first day, the first day of term, uh, that you would present this PowerPoint to the students of your class. And here is what you would tell them. Uh, 
I am excited to be your teacher. My name is Jesus. Um, I am also known as the Almighty One. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the Advocate. I am the author and perfecter of our faith. I am the authority. I am the bread of life. I am the beloved Son of God. I am the bridegroom. I am the chief cornerstone. I am the deliverer. I am the faithful and true. I am the good shepherd. I am the great high priest. I am the head of the church. I am the holy servant. I am the I am. I am the Emmanuel. I am the indescribable gift. I am the judge. I am the king of kings. I am the lamb of God. I am the light of the world. I am the lion of the tribe of Judah. I am the Lord of all. I am the mediator. I am the Messiah, and that takes us through the M, the alphabet. After all, I have been teaching for 2,000 years. This is the teacher. Here's a bit about my family. On my father's side, I am eternal. I have no beginning. I have no ending. On my mother's side, I am from Nazareth and was born of the Virgin Mary. I grew up in the carpenter shop of a man named Joseph. That's on my mother's side. On my father's side, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. On my mother's side, I will be crucified and killed, and on the third day, I will rise again by the power of my Heavenly Father. Uh, over the summer, um, I have been uh, honing my workmanship, which is working on people. I, I have these image uh, flashes in my mind. Suppose I would come to Jesus and I would ask him, uh, Jesus, what do you do? That's a conversation starter that we all use. You know, what, what is your job? Where do you work? What business do you have? Etc. And I, I imagine myself coming up to Jesus and say, Jesus, what, what do you work? And, and he, he, he looks down and he says, you see those people down there uh, in, in the town of Gimpy? Uh, that's my workmanship. That's where I work. That's where I spend my time. This is what I do. I am, I am shaping them. I am crafting them. I am helping them to discover what it looks like to be like myself. This is my workmanship. I've been raising the dead, healing the sick, spending time with the outcasts and lepers. I have been giving eternal life to all those who put their trust in me. In my spare time, I enjoy calling the stars out each night, all one billion trillion of them. And the Bible says he calls them all by name. It's in his spare time. I enjoy extending the mercies of the Lord every morning and demonstrating how faithful I am. I especially like making beautiful sunsets out across Mulu and across the town of Gimpy. And I love when the people just go up there and, what a good job God did tonight. I enjoy hearing the people of the earth celebrate me in worship. I enjoy sending little reminders to me, to my family, of how much they are loved by the Father. Uh, can you imagine Jesus doing that? I'm just going to send a little reminder to him and, and over here to her and, and to this family. I'm going to remind them I love them so much. Uh, Jesus is saying, I enjoy doing that in my spare time. I don't know if he has spare time or not, uh, but he enjoys doing that nonetheless. I enjoy forgiving people of their sins and removing those sins as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says, so far has he removed your transgressions from you. This is who he is. You are going to have a great year learning together. Welcome to school. Now, pedagogy has changed over the years. Pedagogy is this idea of how you teach, the, the methodology, the, the structure. Um, today, it is more the conveyance of information. I tell you as a teacher, two plus two equals four. I tell you that World War II happened in a certain time period. I tell you all the facts and figures, how many people died. I look over at science and say biology is all about this. But that's, that's the pedagogy of today's education model to a large degree. Back then, however, the goal of teaching was believing. In fact, a teacher felt in Jesus' time that if they had not 
persuaded the student to believe just like the master teaches. He has not equipped them for life. That's an important thing to remember. If we are to uh, become like the teacher, we must learn to believe like he, like he teaches. We'll look at that a bit further today. Now, thanks, Cole, for reading the passage of Scripture. I want to reference that narrative just a bit, highlighting especially the, the one verse that says, For in Him we live and move and have our being. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk to you just a little bit. I want to reference that, that, in, that narrative for you. There was a group of people called the Epicureans. Their, their chief purpose in life was to pursue pleasure. Now that's important because Paul is addressing that, that if you want to truly experience all the blessings of the divine nature, which was that passage I quoted from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 11, if you want to experience that divine nature, then you are going to have to understand that true pleasure comes from knowing Him. And the Epicureans pursued pleasure as their chief purpose in life. They valued most of all the pleasure of a peaceful life uh, that was free from pain and, and, and fears and anxieties, including the fear of death. They did, not, they did not deny the existence of gods, but believed that they had nothing to do with man. Now... When we contemplate that God is actively involved in the affairs of man, of humankind. When Paul said this truth, that in him we live and move and have our being. There is this trilogy of events that are occurring that, that our entire life is wrapped up in him. And he's addressing the Epicureans, the Stoics, the other group of people that was there. They believed that everything was God. You know, God's in the trees, God's in the um, environment. Sound familiar? Believe me, folks, there's an agenda out there. There's this agenda of making God less than who he is and elevating the gods with a small g to a point to where we worship it. Now, I'm a firm believer that we should be stewards of, the, uh, of, of God's creation. But we must remind ourselves that the Bible says that one day, one day, this world is going to pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. It's going to burn up. Your your possessions will burn up. Your house is going to burn up. Um, we're not going to get into eschatology. But for those of you that are saved, walking with the Lord, it's all okay. You're going to be, you're going to be safe with God. And I, I don't know if we'll be able to see it all happen or not, but it's going to be a big bang. It's going to be big fireworks. So we look at this world as it is passing away, and we enjoy living here while we have the time and the opportunities to do that. But let's remember that one day Jesus is coming again, and, and we will be transported to a new place, a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Let's keep, keep moving with the uh, narrative that's found in Acts chapter 17. 600 years before Paul was there at the Areopagus, and he was preaching to those people at Mars Hill. There was a terrible plague that came into that city. A man called Epimenides, he had this brilliant idea to release a flock of sheep throughout the town. So just open the door and the sheep went out into the city. And wherever those sheep were when they got tired and they just lay down, the, the god or the idol that that sheep was nearest to was the idol that they sacrificed that sheep to. Now Paul is there and he is, he is looking around. 
And he sees that this town is entirely given to idolatry. He's seeing this. As he walks along, he sees an inscription on an altar that says, To the unknown God. (coughs) Now, Epimenides decided that if there is a sheep that is walking through the town and he happens to get tired and he's not even anywhere close to one of these gods, that they would then sacrifice that lamb or that sheep to the unknown God. And Paul was a brilliant scholar of the Lord Jesus. He was able to weave this narrative into this passage of declaring to the people of Athens that this same unknown God that you have ignorantly worshipped, Him I am declaring to you. And I want you to learn from Him. So that is the narrative of Acts chapter 17. And that is what we are looking at today. He is not far from us, and He wants to teach us. Now, we're going to bounce back and forth between this verse as well. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And the reason I put that, the boots in the Bible there, is because a Christianity, a faith, a lifestyle that does not involve you getting your boots on and walking The life that God wants you to live is no Christianity at all. If the Bible is sandwiched between, firmly planted in your heart, and you are walking that, that's why the Bible says that he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And this is an important truth for us to know and discover as we go throughout life, that unless we walk like he walked, Unless we talk like he talks, then we have nothing really to offer. And this sign out on the church, a place where lives are changed, will have no effect whatsoever. But when we embrace this truth, when we understand and discover that, that the change that occurs when people come into contact with the Scripture and through a lifestyle of holiness, this is what will change people to become more like Jesus and they will get to know their teacher. There is a passage of Scripture in 1 John chapter 4. We're not going to look at the passage, but I want to have my three points from this passage. It's as he is, so are we. Where'd it go? There it is. All right, so as he is, so are we in this world. That's found in 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to look at that a bit more closely. As he is, is this idea of we need to know who he is. We must discover something about him. That passage I quoted from 2 Peter chapter 2 talks about divine nature. It talks about the divine promises. It talks about that if we want to be partakers of these things with God, then we are going to have to have a life that is neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of him. So we need to look at him. Jesus' mission statement was one that intrigues me. Now, uh, Words like always, never, constantly, those are called absolute words. Now, my mother was constantly reminding me that I should always make sure that I never use those words. (laughs) Um, In fact, they say that people that use those words frequently have other disorders as well. Um, but Jesus, Jesus used those words. He used them in ways that we cannot use. Here's one that he said. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I always do those things that please him. How many of you can say that? You're, you're a bit bashful this morning, or at least you're being honest. No, we, we, we don't do that well. 
We, we sometimes please the Father. But there is nobody here that would have the audacity to say that my life is, is, is in such an order that everything I do, God looks upon and says, well done, son. In fact, we can't go by a day without stuffing it up somehow. <coughs> but Jesus said that. I want to look closely at this truth about Jesus pleasing the Father. He pleased the Father by becoming one of us. If there is nothing that endears your heart to the heart of God more than that truth, He came and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He became one of us. This is called incarnation. Incarnation, we're, we're getting close to the Christmas season where we start thinking about this aspect a little bit more in depth about Jesus coming into our world, into our space and time, into our sin-filled world. Here is a pure and holy Son of God from all eternity. He is coming down and humbling Himself and becoming part of us. He became one of us. I think I'll read a story to you that will help you to understand the Incarnation. This is what Jesus did. About 170 years ago, there was a missionary from Belgium. They called him Father Damien. He went to Hawaii to plant churches on the island of Molokai. He planted several churches on the main part of the island, but there was another part of those islands that nobody ever went to willingly. It's a small peninsula that juts out north from the island, and it's separated from the rest of Molokai by an almost sheer cliff two to 3,000 feet high. The only way to get to that peninsula was either to jump off the cliff or go by boat in the open ocean. That deserted peninsula was where the Hawaiians abandoned all their lepers. Understand lepers, people that had leprosy. If you got leprosy in Hawaii, you were taken to this peninsula and abandoned. Father Damien felt a call to the people there who had been cast off, <coughs> outcasts, removed from society. And he worked there just as he had done on the rest of the island. He built a church with his own hands, helped them to build a society, even helping them build houses for themselves. And he lived among them and sought to humbly serve them in any way he could. Now, just I'll, I'll, I'll digress just a bit. Leprosy is a disease that basically does away with the feelings of the pain nerves. And that's why you see so many deformed lepers is because you know, they can cut their finger off and they don't even feel it. And so they're, they, they, they burn themselves. They, the pain is gone. So Father Damien is there. He's humbly serving them in any way he could. One day, after he had been there for about 15 years, he was cooking a meal and was boiling some water. When he spilled the water onto his bare foot. He realized there was no pain when it splashed on his foot. So he tried it again. He purposely poured the boiling water on his foot and there was absolutely no pain. That could only mean one thing. He now had leprosy. The next Sunday in church, as he began to lead the people in worship, he didn't give his normal greeting. You see, every Sunday, he would start his, his, uh, his sermon with this, this phrase, my fellow believers. But this Sunday, he began by saying, my fellow lepers. He had in every way become one of them, even taking upon himself their greatest pain. Jesus enters our world, and he is not ashamed to call us his brethren. 
There's so much in that passage. And as I always do, I prepare way too much material for the short amount of time that I have. Um, One benefit of that is you have material for the next time. But I would like to just um, point out another absolute that Jesus adhered to. He always did his Father's will. And we mentioned earlier that he always pleased the Father. Here it says, he always did the Father's will. John chapter 6, verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Even if it meant in the garden of Gethsemane, looking into that cup, He said, Father, if it's possible, if it's at all possible, remove this cup from me. He was looking into that cup. It was a a figurative cup. It was not a real one. But he was looking into that. And he saw the sins of the entire world. He saw the, uh, the, 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 the Hitler sins. He saw the Jeffrey Dahmer sins. He saw all the sins of the most gruesome and vilest of sinners. And he looked into that cup. And he saw each one of your sins in that cup. And he says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless. I'll do what you want me to do. And he drank that cup. It had your sins in that cup. Hallelujah, what a Savior. If we are to learn of him, then we must become like him. As he is, so are we in this world. He always did his Father's will. Third absolute word He never started something he did not finish. Now, I was researching myself. I found one fault, uh, among many, of course. But one one of my big weaknesses is I tend to start things that I don't finish. My children would testify to that. My wife would testify to that. And if you would know me well enough, you would testify to that. I, I, I like activity, I like, I like to see progress, but the little details, you know, making sure that the last screw is put in, I tend to just, someday I'll do that. Jesus never started something he did not finish. When he came to that manger as a little baby, remember this was eternally in the heart of God. This was only a path to Calvary. And he came to do the will of his Father who was in heaven. And when, when he set his mind to do something, he always did that for which he had been sent out to do. And it culminated in that cry from the cross when he says, It is finished. The work which you have given me to do, Father, I have finished it. The price has been paid. The atonement has been given. My offering for sin has been made on the cross, and I am shedding my blood for the sins of the entire world. Point number two. So are we in this world. We have a mulberry tree. I don't know if you have mulberries this year or not, but we have mulberries aplenty. Usually the birds are competing with us, but we have, uh, we have mulberries that we, we put into cobblers, we put it into pies, we put it into smoothies, we put it into cream. We've, we, uh, we've had plenty of mulberries. If my son comes and says, Dad, I've been picking mulberries, There's one place I look, two places actually. One is his mouth. The second is his hands. If neither of those is not purple, he's lying to me. There has to be evidence. You cannot pick mulberries. You cannot eat mulberries without evidence. Even us big people. We had one 
young boy that was trying to take some home with him one Sunday afternoon several years ago, and he put, it, put, it, put a bunch of mulberries into his pocket. His mom got home and was bathing him that night and noticed his huge bruise on his leg. <laughs> Says, son, what's wrong? She said, it doesn't hurt at all. No, not at all. And she realized it was mulberry stains. There, there is evidence of mulberry picking. There's evidence of mulberry eating. And as we, as we have looked at, as he is, so are we. Now I want you to capture that truth. Because we have talked about this, this verse right here. Let's go back to that one. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. He that says he has picked mulberries will have stains on his mouth and stains on his finger. You cannot avoid that. Same way this verse right here. If you say you walk in him, then you should have the evidence of his life upon your life. We're going to have to move through this quickly. There is a story in the Bible that I want to conclude with. Before I give you that story, I want to highlight a verse from Galatians chapter 6, verse 17. And forgive me if I have shared this verse here. I know I've shared it out a little before. But there is a verse that says, here's what it says. From, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Remember the mulberries? For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I, I pondered that verse years ago. What does it mean? And I, I enjoy word studies. I, I love looking at original Greek and Hebrew words. And I looked up this word, it, it, marks. That's, that's where my attention was. And one of the things that always intrigues me is when the Apostle Paul especially, when he, when he used just one word in all of the epistles that he wrote. He, he was very deliberate in his choice of words. But this word, marks, is a word that we get our English word from. And I'll tell you what, it, I'm going to read it to you in, in the way that we get our English word. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the stigma of the Lord Jesus. It's an interesting word. Now, we think of stigma as a negative thing. Uh, we think of stigma as something that, uh, oh yeah, he's one of those. Uh, he's from that side of town. Uh, we, we think of stigma as negative. But I want you to think of this as a positive thing. Are you bearing in your body, in your life, in your lifestyle, in your, in your uh, demeanor, are you representing that you have been with Jesus? Is the stigma of Christ upon you? Now, the story that I want to conclude with is about this Hebrew slave. And I think you probably know what this is all about. It says in Exodus chapter 21, verse 6, He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Let me just give you the background of this. If a Hebrew servant said, I love my master, my wife, and my children, and I do not want to go out free as a free person. Uh, and that was the law, that these servants would be set free after a certain amount of years, and they would then be able to start their own life. But if that Hebrew servant says, I love my master, I love what I'm doing, he has provided so well for me, he has given, him, given me everything I need, and all these things I'm enjoying, and I don't want to forfeit that then the master of that servant is to take this, that servant and bring him to the doorpost and the master would get an awl or a chisel or a, a, a punch, a sharp punch, and he would make a hole in that servant's ear, put the ear against the, the door and whack, and there would be a hole there. And that, mat, that servant then would become a servant for life. 
Now, can you imagine this servant being out in the cotton fields, in the, in the fields, toiling away? It's hot. It's, he's sweating. He wonders, why did I ever make this decision? And he reaches up there to wipe some sweat from his face, and he feels that hole in his ear, and he says, oh, yeah, I, I, I can't get away from this. I bear in my body the stigma of being a voluntary follower of this master. Remember, the goal of a disciple is to become like his master. And that's what God wants to do with you today. He wants to take you to his doorpost. And I don't know if you know what that doorpost is, but on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, an emblem of suffering and shame. And that is the entrance to which you must go. It is a doorway through which all people of all ages, of all classes, the, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And no one has ever entered the walkway of holiness until they have, first of all, come to the cross voluntarily, surrendering their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And He puts His mark upon them, and they are His. And then He helps us to walk in this world. As He is, so are we in this world. Let's pray. Father, we conclude with the psalmist in Psalm 40, verse 6, where it says that sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. The psalmist, Lord, was referring to that truth of the Hebrew servant. God has opened our ears by bringing us into his family. We acknowledge, Lord, that we have nothing of ourself. We are nothing, but alone through your power, we can be set free. Whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. So, Lord, take us to that doorpost. Father, if there are people here today that do not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would invite them to the cross where they can learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We dedicate ourselves to you, Lord, for your service and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.